everybody say ribeye. Ribeye. Well done. Outstanding. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Pete, and I'm a forage agronomist. Yeah. yeah. You're supposed to say hi, Pete. <laughs> Thank you. Outstanding. So, um, it is a pleasure to be here. I want to make sure that I hit the right buttons. Uh, before I get started, here's the disclaimer. Uh, my opinions that I'm going to present are my opinions. They're not those of my employer, Baron Brogue USA, or its customers, or of the universities that I've attended, worked at, or still work with. Okay? But they should be. <laughs> So, uh, my blog is called Grass-Based Health, and this is uh, my attempt to reflect my experience and training in soil and plants as an agronomist, and animals as a ruminant nutritionist, and my experience as a human being who's had his life impacted by switching to a diet based on animal products rather than cereal products. And yes, each one of these influences each other, the circle doesn't just go one way, and in fact, the circle guts, it cuts across the circle. They're all interrelated, they all affect one another. Now I see my role in what's happening as standing between two communities. I stand between the agricultural community on the one side, and I'm an agriculturalist, and I'm proud of it. And on the other side is the paleo primal low carb community. And I'm proud to be part of that. And I, I want both communities to talk with each other because I think we really need to learn from each other. And so one of the things that happened this last January is I was able to get Adele Height to come and speak at a special little symposium that we did at the American Forage and Grassland Council. And not too surprisingly for anyone who's heard Adele, she wowed them and they're still talking about her. And so this year there's a follow-on session coming up. So wherever you're planted, grow there, okay? And when I first proposed this talk, I envisioned talking about water cycles and how animals are part of that. But what that quickly showed me is that a lot of people in the sustainability quote-unquote world have used poor data to denigrate ruminant agriculture in terms of water use. And I wanted to talk about nutrient cycling and all the various things that are involved there, but likewise, you start uncovering sort of conventional wisdom and some urban myths. And so that kind of got me distracted. And, and, and then, of course, I wanted to talk about the carbon cycle, which I talked about last year, and the idea that grazing animals are actually carbon negative, regardless of what else you think about that whole debate. And there's a lot to think about that whole debate, okay? But we're not gonna go there. All that, plus an invitation from Aaron, got me distracted into asking the question, is an ancestral diet sustainable? Well, I guess we need to define what an ancestral diet is. Others are more qualified to do that than I am, and we've heard some good discussion about that. The second thing we need to define is just what the heck is sustainable. And that tends to be a nice, fuzzy, fluffy, define it to your advantage kind of term. Well, how about we focus it down just a little bit to what I'm trained in, which are ruminant animals and ruminant agriculture. Is ruminant agriculture sustainable? Because at least in this country, an ancestral diet is going to have a significant component from ruminants. Last year I talked about the fundamental nature of ruminants and the role that they play. It was just mentioned that the vast majority of the Earth's land surface is occupied by grassland. And most of that is land that is incapable of producing food that's directly utilizable by humans. Humans cannot digest cellulose, but ruminants can because of the microbiology that they have in their rumen, and they digest high fiber diets. Um, actually, they ingest high fiber diets and then end up digesting a high fat diet, which we then can ingest and digest as well. So 
Uh, that's the question. But as I've gone down this path, what I've found is every time I confront one of these boxes and break through that box, I discover that there's another box. And I don't know how many more of those boxes there are. But I'm here to maybe start talking about a few of them in hopes that we can talk about those. Because if we're going to have this conversation back and forth between agriculture and paleo primal, whatever you want to call it, if you go to agriculture and you repeat some of the things that I have heard at these meetings, those are demonstrably wrong. It's not a matter of opinion. And if you give that to them, they're going to shut you off for the rest of your message to them that may well be right. And that's going to create an artificial barrier to something that could improve their lives, and that's a darn shame. I'll give you an example. A very famous person, much beloved in various communities, wrote in a book about how nitrogen fertilizer burns the organic matter out of soils. It's a false statement, demonstrably so. In fact, it's 180 degrees wrong. I don't know about anybody else, but when I come across something like that in a book, it's real hard to finish reading that book. Oh, oh, that's good. Okay, cool. This morning I had the blue screen of death on my notebook. And then I just saw the black screen of death. So I firmly believe that sacred cows make the best burgers. And they do say that if you're with a group of people that you agree with 100%, you're probably in a cult. <laughs> it may be my role to prove that the paleo community is not a cult. Last year, I made the point that the United States livestock industry is already based on forages today. All livestock and poultry, the total feed consumption, the portion of the ration that is concentrate versus forage is one third concentrate, two thirds forage. That's today. Now, could it be better? Absolutely, but that's hardly all grain. There you go again. For beef cattle, For all beef cattle, the nation's cow herd. Is that thing even on? There it is. Okay. 17% of the feed that goes into supporting the nation's cow herd, beef cow herds, is concentrate versus 83% that's forage. And yes, when you, sh when you shift um, cattle to feed, obviously you're going to feed them more concentrate, but you're still going to feed them over a quarter of their ration as forage, okay? And we'll talk a little later about what a real life production cycle looks like for beef cattle. Just so you know, so that when you have a chance to talk to a cattle rancher, you might, you know, not shut down the conversation. No, all right, like that. Okay, so last year I also talked about some of the nutritional aspects of meat, grass finished versus grain finished and dealt with some of the things. Here's some new information that I got from Dr. Susan Duckett at Clemson University. Here on the far left is grain-fed beef and grass-fed finished beef. This is the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, and they say somewhere that the ideal ought to be somewhere around four to one. Now, I think we could talk at great length about how important that really is, but those are the targets that were given so far. The point here is, this is what's achievable in research, grain feeding. That's significantly different than we frequently hear people say for grain finished beef. So clearly there's some management things that we could apply to produce beef with a lower omega-6 to omega-3 ratio if that turns out to be something that we really want. But if you go then to the market and you buy a ribeye steak, yes, you see that's a little higher 
than what they produced in their research, and then pork chop, and then the chicken, and so on to the salmon. I'm not convinced that we know enough to get all exercised about omega-6 to omega-3 over 4 point, but if you are, then don't be eating pork, don't be eating chicken, okay? I'm not saying not to eat pork and chicken. What I'm saying is if you're saying that you have to have grass-fed beef in order to have that ratio, then be consistent and don't eat pork and don't eat chicken. Okay, now it's probably got a lot to do with the nature of the digestive system. So ruminants are probably always going to be on the low end, and the modified monogastrics and the poultry kind of digestive system is probably going to be on the high end. If you want to look in terms of total amounts, here's the evidence. Um, you can get a whopping amount of omega-6 out of a serving of chicken thigh. Now again, I don't know how important that is, but again, maybe that sheds some light on how much emphasis we want to put on which way to produce beef or whatever. So I guess one take home message is regardless of the finishing method, uh, grass fed, grain fed, beef is not a particularly rich source of omega-6 or omega-3. Anybody remember the story about the GMO grass that was killing cows? Anybody hear that? It was a big, big deal because so many people wanted that to be true. They wanted that to be proof of the hazard of GMO. First of all, um, it turns out, and I don't really have the time, I could go into it for anybody that wants to know about it. Uh, the story was ultimately retracted, but that doesn't matter, it's out there and it's on the web and so now everyone you know it's available to anyone to repeat but if you do that in agricultural community they're going to know that you don't know okay so male bovine fecal matter <laughs> they used to say that if you give a million monkeys typewriters they will reproduce shakespeare and now thanks to the internet we know that's not true <laughs> but it doesn't have to be on the web and sometimes it can be maybe not as important as some of these other things. Uh, you may recognize these illustrations from Gary Taubes' book, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It. The stocky cow on the top is an Aberdeen Angus. The Jersey cow on the bottom, the, the, the lean cow on the bottom is a Jersey cow. Well, here's a tip, okay? Um, oh, come on, there we go. That's a cow, that's not a cow, okay? Uh, we can tell this because of the pronounced hump and the thickened body. Those are secondary sexual characteristics of any male bovine. Okay. Also, the pizzle is a dead giveaway. All right. I can't tell whether it's got a scrotum, so I can't tell you if it's a bull or a stag, but clearly this was at least achieved maturity before it was castrated, if it in fact is a stag. Now, I was one of the many agricultural people to write him a letter and kindly point all this out. Um, he didn't really, well, he did reply to me, actually. That was kind. That didn't say much. Um, but clear, we can make the point. I mean, his point that different breeds of animals partition feed energy differently is, of course, true. And we ought to take that on board within the primal paleo community. There are genetic differences in how we partition the same feed energy, right? But why not use an actual picture of beef cows versus dairy cows? If you feed the same amount of grain to a beef cow, she'll get fat. Dairy cows genetically partition that feed energy more into milk production. And in fact, we even have genetic differences between Holstein cattle from New Zealand and Holstein cattle from North America. Because in New Zealand, historically, their Holsteins have been less effective at partitioning feed energy into milk. So they get fat easier. Turns out North American cattle are insulin resistant. Okay, Jared Diamond, his famous quote that the worst mistake in the history of the human race is agriculture. Well, if that's so, it's re rather remarkable that the humanity has made that same mistake four times, at least three. China's perhaps debatable. 
and they made it all within about a thousand years of each other in widely dispersed parts of the world in many different ways, different systems, but they developed those manipulations of the environment to produce food to benefit themselves. Uh, kind of hard to see what's going on here, but you can see the St. Louis skyline. There's the arch. Okay, I am standing on top of this. Anybody been to Cahokia? This is the largest and oldest extant earthen structure in the Americas. In about 1,000 common era, it was larger than London at the time. And it was surrounded by corn as far as the eye can see. Agriculture has a long place within North, Meso, and Southern America. But by the time most Europeans arrived, those people had been wiped out by disease and left very, very little trace for subsequent people to recognize as agriculture as they knew it. So, what's more Americana than the image of massive herds of buffalo roaming across the plain? Well, there's evidence to suggest that those massive herds were in fact a pathological symptom of a disrupted ecological system. They did not exist prior to Columbus, and they could not have been sustained much longer. The capstone species of that ecosystem, Homo sapiens, had been removed. If you've got thousands of acres of corn under production, you don't want that little unit coming through and is all his buddies. Uh, but I'm a forage agronomist, so what do I know? <laughs> so let's move more into uh, forage agronomy, okay? So one of the aspects of forage agronomy, and in fact a developing move within commercial agriculture, are practices that lead to increased organic matter in the soil. Soil types are defined by the depth of their organic matter layer. This particular one is defined by an organic matter layer of that depth. After 10 years of this practice of no tillage agriculture with cover cropping, it's now been doubled. That's sequestered carbon, that's improved fertility, that's improved infiltration of water, that's improved productivity of the land. As we practice this new method of cultivation or lack of cultivation, we have increased soil macrobiology, microbiology. We now have such active turnover of surface litter that those fields no longer qualify for no tillage per the SCS qualifications. My goodness, okay. All right, there we go again, come back, okay. We reduce soil erosion, keep your eye right here. Come on, there we go. The water that's coming off that field of fully conventional corn production is cleaner than the water that's running down the roadside ditch. There's a rainfall simulation device. We have a clean field, clean tillage represented here. We have a cover crop represented here. We have overgrazed or poor pasture here. We have well-managed pasture here. Rainfall was being simulated from above. The what runs off the surface is being collected. And in the, in the time it takes to fill that gallon jug of sediment-filled water from surface runoff, there's none in the pasture. So grass in pasture or grass in cover crop is going to improve infiltration, it's going to reduce soil erosion, it's going to improve surface water quality. Okay, here we go. Um, cattle production. The role of a cow is to produce a calf. That's how she makes you money. She is going to do that on, on a 12-month schedule. So she's going to calve, 
She's going to then produce milk and lactation for maybe five months. But you have to have her rebred three months after she calves if she's going to calve again 12 months later. Okay? Now, how about the young stock? Well, the young stock, okay, here they're born, here they're weaned. Most of the cow-calf enterprises are going to move those cattle into some, some other operation, either their own, where they retain ownership, or someone else is going to take them into a stocker phase. This phase, where they're going to take those animals from about 400 some pounds up to 800 some pounds, okay? They're going to sell those animals then into a feeding operation and any animals that are going to be killed are going to be killed by 22 months to ensure that they have optimal tenderness and best meat quality. That's the challenge for grass-fed meat is to get that to happen. Okay? Uh, heifers are going to be bred at about 15 months so that they can then calve when they're two years old. Heifers that don't conceive or for some reason aren't going to be retained as breeding animals are going to enter into, again, a backgrounding phase, and then they're going to end up in a feedlot for perhaps four months, maybe six. The economic pressure is to make that shorter and shorter and shorter. And when a cat steer or a heifer enters into a feedlot, they're not going to go on a 100% grain diet, right? They have to come in, they have to be gradually introduced to those higher energy rations lest they get ill. So, unfortunately, pasture doesn't produce feed year-round. It doesn't produce it consistently. It doesn't produce the same quality. So here's tall fescue. Very common to see this kind of curve for cool season grasses. How are you going to make that system work year-round? Especially if you have that kind of feed demand. Notice the deficits. This is where it's expensive to feed animals. Well, we could start adding legumes, clovers, have a little different growth habit. We can start putting those together into a mixed stand with tall fescue, red and white clover works very well. Less Lestadiza can work in some areas. Now we filled in that summer gap a little bit, but we still have a gap here in the winter, uh, you know, late winter, late fall, early winter. What else can we do? How about we look at alfalfa as an option? We can grow alfalfa and tall fescue together, and now we have this kind of production but notice what's happening. We've got this huge amount of surplus here. What are we gonna do with that? We can make hay, we can make fermented forage so we can get the benefits for them that people like from their fermented vegetable. Okay, how about we stockpile? Stockpiling is a practice where at this point we uh, apply, we defer grazing. We allow this to grow with some fertilizer application to build up a bank of green feed. We then graze it off rather than feed it. But how about we start putting all kinds of things together? The point to make here is this is all management. This isn't natural, but that's okay. But let's be serious about it. Okay, it's going to take inputs in order to get the outputs. And notice what we've done to increase what we could potentially carry and minimize the amount of feed that we need to import, supplement, feed from stored feeds. Okay, uh, We do talk about calories because we do understand that that's a useful term. Here's a mature cow um, and this is what she needs for maintenance. This is what she needs for lactation. She gives birth but her feed requirements increase till peak lactation. Then she's um, the, we wean and now you have a pregnancy requirement that takes off. What does that look like? Um, we can convert those figures into a dry feed equivalent because we can figure out what the feed value is. And then we can say, what would happen if we shift from a fall calving system to a spring calving system? Maybe we can align the animal's requirements up with the feed demand. And that's, again, another major uh, management technique. So here's some concluding thoughts. Modern ancestral diet is sustainable. We can define those terms. 
modern ruminant agriculture can be profitable. Didn't make that point, but take my word for it, we can talk about that. Modern management practices not only protect, but enhance natural resources. Ruminant agriculture is more resilient than other forms of agricultural practice. That's an important concept. True sustainability will not come from misanthropic philosophies. It's going to have to come from actual scientific application. Prosperity leads to reduced population growth and environmental conservation investments. That's something that we've seen worldwide. There's abundant data. What is undeniably unsustainable is that obesity rates for adults could re I mean, these are the figures. We're all kind of familiar with these projections, right? That's what's unsustainable. And so if you can produce a carbohydrate heavy diet sustainably, but can't sustain the cost of feeding it to your populations, then that's an exercise in perhaps missing the point. And if we have that impact on our health, we impact our prosperity and therefore we will have a negative impact on our environment. So based on all that, that's the take home message that red meat is green. Okay, thank you. Any questions?